This is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. Happy Friday. We made it through another busy week. And if you can't remember what happened in the news over the last few days, well, you are in the right place. It's time for our weekly news recap. About 500 people seeking asylum in the U.S. have been transported from the border by Texas Governor Greg Abbott since the end of last month. Today, Governor Pritzker issuing a disaster declaration to allow the state to cut through red tape and quickly release money to pay for hotels and medical care for the migrants. Ann Burke has served on the Illinois Supreme Court since 2006. Her last day on the bench will be November 30th. 30th Lord Alderman Ariel Raborius is the latest in a long growing line of Chicago council members deciding to call it quits. That's a lot. And there's a whole lot more. So here to help us make sense of the week is WTTW political correspondent Amanda Vinicky. Welcome back, Amanda. Thanks so much for having me. Happy Friday. Also with us is WBEZ city government reporter Mariah Wolfel. Hey, Mariah. Hey. And Mike Lowe, reporter for WGN-TV News. Welcome back, Mike. Great to be here. It's been a minute. Yeah, a couple months. (laughs) Yeah, let's give a special shout out to the folks who are watching us right now. We're breaking down the week's news live on WBEZ's Facebook as well as WBEZ's YouTube pages. Let's dive right in, Mariah, because this has now become a regular thing here on The Recap and just here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Another alderman calling it quits. This time, it's Northwest Side 30th Ward Alderman Ariel Raboyris saying that he won't seek re-election. What is going on at City Council? Yeah, we, we've talked about it on this show before. There's multiple factors at play. I feel like we have here. new names to add every week. Oh yes, here I mean literally every week. I think last week it was two aldermen we added to the list. And um, here we go. Yeah, so so I mean, depending on who you ask, you'll get a different answer. But there are some common themes. There's how the pandemic has made it extremely difficult to be an elected official. You are the, especially as an alderman, you're the first line of defense. You're the first government um, body that that constituents are going to for you know. Anything from needing a vaccine, a mask, to not liking, you know, federal immigration policies, you know, that's that's the first door that people knock on um, when they're dissatisfied with their government. Um, there's also the factor of just like natural turnover in the city council, you know, so it, it's not uncommon for an alderman to serve two three terms and decide that, you know, they've accomplished what they want to accomplish in the council. And there's a new mayor that they didn't start under. And so they're going to move on to a new phase of their life. Yeah. Um, And then there's also this contentious city council we've seen in the past four years, this friction between the mayoral administration, which has its own priorities that it wants to push in the council and a... um, a cohort of young, very motivated new council members who want to push their own citywide policy and got elected on reform. And then there are some old school aldermen in the council who who don't see that as their role and who are, you know, have historically focused on giving constituents, uh, delivering constituent services and, um, you know, feel that they've done that. And now it's it's time to move on. Everything's coming to a head. Your thoughts, Mike, on this aldermanic exodus and what's behind it? I think it speaks to a a number of the factors that that were just listed, just how difficult it's become during the pandemic. I know uh, Alderman Raboyris referenced the idea that you don't even really interact with your colleagues on the council anymore. Most of the committee meetings are done via Zoom, uh, and then you get a lot of the complaints, more so than probably they've ever gotten before because of all the issues that have come up during the pandemic. And it just, I think it speaks to the how much criticism public officials have been under yeah. uh, for, throughout the entire last two years. And so people are saying, you know, I think I've had enough. It's time for somebody else to do this job. Did he say specifically, Mariah, why he was retiring? Well, he listed several inter, uh, reasons in an interview with the Sun-Times that were frankly a little bit more candid than his statement that he released. In his statement, he said he wants to prioritize his family. It's time to let a younger leader take his position. In an interview with Fran Spielman of the Chicago Sun-Times, he said he's, quote, sick of this, um, speaking of the city council. <laughs> also clarifying <laughs> that he has no ill will against the council or the mayor, but, you know, that he's been in government for nearly 20 years. Um, he also cited uh, police reform as an issue, you know, or reform in general, government reform being a huge priority for many elected officials and constituents. Um, it just being a little bit too much to handle. You know, Raboyris is a staunch police advocate, has been an advocate for the police union, was head of the public safety committee under reform mm-hmm. that came out of the Laquan McDonald shooting. And so he's been kind of on the front lines um 
as a police advocate during those times. And so I think he he also cited that just being a little bit too prominent for his taste nowadays. Yeah. Uh, I think he cited se- several other reasons. Well, and, and I think what also hasn't been listed yet is that many of the people that are leaving, including Alderman Reboiras, could have had a really tough time keeping their seats had they yeah. not backed away. A right. lot of the people who are resigning would have had, if, if they don't have the fight in them, they for sure weren't going back because yeah. there is going to be a fight in the next election for which petitions are being passed around now. So it's sort of time to make that decision. And it also, to me, is just sort of interesting that the tenor of this whole conversation, because, you know, a, a couple of years back and how we got, in part, Governor Bruce Rauner statewide was because of a conversation and a push for term limits. Mm. And part of the argument against it is that, all right, there's both elections and then also natural turnover. And the expectation is that politicians aren't going to let that happen, that they'll sit there forever. And clearly many of these, uh, the members of the city council who are leaving have been on for quite some time. But also some of this is something that constituents have said they want. And I think it will be interesting to see sort of this um, entanglement of institutional knowledge and all of that leaving and and what so much turnover does mean. It's sort of a, a test of term limits without having them instituted. Absolutely. Right. And uh, in Raboyris's case, five candidates have already announced that they plan to run, including Jessica Gutierrez, which is the daughter of former Congressman Luis uh, Gutierrez. I want to turn to Illinois Supreme Court Justice Ann Burke. Amanda, uh, who announced that she's also retiring. What's she going to be remembered for? You know, she has remembered in part, I think, for really some of her legacy outside of the Illinois Supreme Court, and that is her role in the Special Olympics. Um, She'll also be remembered, yes, as the wife of Alderman Ed Burke, who we are still waiting to see what his future plans are when it comes to running for re-election or not, because, of course, he is facing some federal court corruption charges. She will be gone, therefore, from the state's high court by the time he at long last goes on trial. And so I don't know what was in the calculation for her in terms of when to step away, but certainly it would have been in every story, every newscast, you kind of can't discount it. Even if, yeah. no, those those corruption charges would not have gone before the Illinois Supreme Court. When you have somebody that is currently the, the chief justice, that's going to raise questions. A lot of this is perception, right? So um, she will be leaving. Um, and I, I think she'll also be remembered in what her resignation or retirement statement talked about was some of the reforms. There's been a lot of conversation about the Safety Act. And this is this major criminal justice overhaul that the headliner is that it does away with cash bail in Illinois, but it does a lot of other things and a lot of other things, including the court system. So while it hasn't necessarily been focused on, the Illinois Supreme Court is not just making decisions. It also is sort of in charge of all of the other courts. So there's been a lot that she has been in charge of as the chief justice during the pandemic with getting the courts up to speed with that law and being able to function at a time where things largely moved remote. Anyone think that her retirement might motivate Ed Burke to retire? <laughs> Everyone looked at me. <laughs> Mariah. <laughs> City Council reporter way in. I mean, I, I'm not going to dare to predict what Ed Burke is going to do. <laughs> Come on, tell us. Um, I, I, I think I think I would be surprised if Ed Burke decided not to run again. You know, the first charge was announced uh, uh, against him was announced a month before the February 2019 election. And he not only said he was going to run, but that he was going to win, you know, doubled down on rerunning running again for election. He hasn't said publicly whether he's going to. Um, and he is, you know, within some danger within his ward because of the remap, the ways in which they mapped out some of his base mm-hmm. within the 14th ward. Um, but, you know, I think he's a strong-headed uh, alderman, and, and I... All right, I'll take you off the hot seat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's actually, and before we move on, can I j- add one interesting thing about sort of this Burke resignation, and yeah. that is um, elections, elections everywhere! Yes. But she will be leaving after this November 8th election of this year, which means that a, a replacement has already been decided who mm-hmm. will be taking that seat, but and will hold it through to 2024. That's when, by the way, already we've gotten notice that there's going to be a big matchup for that, what will be an open, essentially, Supreme Court seat, although presumably the appointee will make a run for it. Because 
because Latinos are really upset. The person chosen to replace um, Justice Burke is a first appellate um, court justice, Joy Cunningham, um, and she will be the second black woman to sit on the Illinois Supreme Mm -hmm. Court. But um, Latinos are saying, hey, wait a second. There's no Latino representation. And they are upset that this was the choice of the current Illinois Supreme Court bench and are saying that they're, they're going to make a big issue of this heading into 2024 That's already. That's a good point. This if is you, Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. We're going behind the headlines in the weekly news recap with WTTW's Amanda Vinicky, WBEZ's Mariah Wolfel, and Mike Lowe of WGN-TV News. I do want to remind that you can now watch us do this recap live on WBEZ's Facebook and YouTube pages. You can also, while you're there, you can leave us a comment or question on the YouTube. Talk to us in the YouTube chat box. I may just read what you have to say on air and throw those questions to those guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to shift gears, though. Governor Pritzker issued a a disaster proclamation over the migrants uh, still being bused here from from Texas. What exactly does this do to help the migrants, Amanda? Uh, It will just facilitate really cooperation between state agencies as well as local authorities in terms of managing this. Uh, Shifting money and resources can be more complex. There's a whole lot of red tape, some of which is why people roll their eyes at government. Some of that is their for necessary reasons. Yeah. This just allows them to really cooperate so that the these um, immigrants are going to be able to receive as best as possible, uh, be it housing, health care, whatever services can be freed up without that red tape sort of getting in the way. And then also it, it the governor has assigned 75 National Guard members to help to work with that because this is uh, sort of a, a new thing. Otherwise, in government, you don't have any force that is dedicated to dealing with it. Yeah. Mike, do you think the governor is going to get pushback for devoting resources, as Amanda just pointed out, toward these migrants when there are residents here already living in Chicago may have some similar needs? Yeah, I I think the overall reaction uh, just from talking to people about this issue is the way that the blue states that are receiving these bus loads or or plane uh, plane loads of immigrants coming into their communities, uh, the especially Governor Pritzker, they're handling it fairly well. And at this point, people, um, I think, view that as as what we should be doing, living up to the values that he says he espouses. Uh, so I don't think right now there's a lot of pushback. But if this becomes a situation where there are thousands of people and, it, and it's overwhelming municipalities, and you've already gotten some pushback from local mayors who say that the governor – uh, hasn't, for example, uh, his office hasn't talked to the mayor before sending people mm-hmm. or, or those kinds of things. So there's there's pockets of pushback. But I think the overall uh, sense of this is the, the blame is being laid upon Governor Abbott and Governor DeSantis here in Chicago um, yeah. with with some consternation from local mayors who are saying we we would like some better communication from the governor's yeah, office. Yeah, Governor DeSantis, who seems to be on board with the strategy, he's sent plane loads of migrants to Martha's Vineyard this week as well. I want to hear a bit more from Pritzker, though. Earlier this week, he called Texas Governor Greg Abbott's behavior cruel. Here's what else he had to say. The governor of Texas needs to stop sowing chaos and needs to actually work with states if he's going to, you know, send people. And let's make sure these people actually wanted to go to the states that they're being sent to, because otherwise it's kidnapping. Prisker said Illinois officials are looking into whether there's any criminal liability here for for this uh, Texas program. Fill us in briefly, Amanda. Well, yeah, and he points out that these immigrants are in the country legally as they wait for perhaps permanent legal status, seeking asylum in many cases, as they were in oftentimes fleeing violent situations. There, there's a lot I think that is un unknown about this. Um, You hear from Governor Abbott and DeSantis, hey, wait, if you want to declare sanctuary status in your cities and your states, this is what you have signed up for. Don't complain about it. Don't complain about the cost and the surprise. These are the things that uh, they say they are dealing with as southern states. You have to, I think, keep in mind, these are individuals that has to be so scary to be on a bus, not speaking um, any sort of native tongue. And so, as Mike pointed out, I think generally the reception in Illinois has been, how can we help these people that are coming um, from harm's way? But I do expect that this is going to be very much a political issue, frankly, on both sides. And that sounds horrible because it's just pointed out, I mean, these are humans. These are these are kids. Um, But It is playing into politics. It's playing into a presidential election very much against Joe Biden. Again, 
Pritzker is oft mentioned as somebody who might be seeking a national platform such as the White House. This puts him on the national stage. Mm -hmm. It might um, help invigorate some of Mayor Lightfoot's base. You've sort of seen a unified front between Lightfoot and Pritzker that you hadn't previously. So there's a lot that is going on at very much a human level as well as a political one. And as we approach an election, Republicans know that this is an issue that they tend to have an advantage on in polls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, being tough on the border and immigration and so forth. Uh, Maybe not in cities like ours, but in most of the country, there's a sense of we need to get tough on the border. And so they know that this is something that they can rile up voters for uh, about right before the election. So that being said, I I just want a consensus here. Is it likely we're going to see more migrants being bussed or flown to Chicago? What does everyone think? I think we're going to see a lot more of it. Yeah. I yes. Think, yeah. And I think leaders are expecting it too. Lightfoot said at that press conference, you know, we just received, they just, the 11th bus arrived here this past week and she expects yeah. this to continue. Got more than 500. Race. It's working. They, they, this was done in a very public fashion yeah. by the Southern governors. So what they had wanted is very much happening. And what I think I'll be sort of watching is now that this has been brought to the part to the forefront. Part of this goes back to the lack of federal immigration reform, just not dealing with it, period. Yes. And and that is really on Congress. <laughs> and it, there isn't really any sort of hope at this point that this is going to change that. But the more that this is in the conversation, perhaps, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. All right, we'll leave it there for now. We'll pick up the weekly news recap in just a moment with WTTW political correspondent Amanda Vinicky, WBEZ city government reporter Mariah Wolfel, and Mike Lowe with WGN-TV News. But first, the line has reopened for people to view the coffin of Queen Elizabeth II. Here's Lisa. Yeah, that line was closed for seven hours. Now officials, though, in London say people who are in this five-mile queue might have to stand there for more than 24 hours before they reach Westminster Hall. And and it's going to be cold during the night tonight. Authorities have installed more than 500 portable toilets along the queue. They're giving about, they've got about 1,000 stewards and marshals on duty at any given time. Hundreds of thousands of people are expected to pay their respects before Monday's state funeral. Also, you can hear the state funeral starting at 5 o'clock Monday morning here at 91.5. Now, people around Chicago and in the suburbs are celebrating celebrating Mexican Independence Day today. The Mexican consulate in Chicago is participating in events out in Aurora, in Cicero, Waukegan, also in Northwest Indiana. They'll also be at Pilsen Fest on Chicago's South Side tomorrow and on Sunday. Celebrations began last weekend with Mexican Independence Day parades in Pilsen and Little Village. Every donation matters. Every person counts. That's how WBEZ works. This news, these stories, they will always be here. But in order to keep that promise, WBEZ needs listeners like you to step in and give what you can. Your participation matters far more than the amount. Giving is quick, easy, and it makes a real difference. Please, it's time to give the gift that's right for you at wbez.org slash donate. After a 70-year reign, Queen Elizabeth II will be laid to rest at Windsor Castle. Queen Elizabeth was a life well lived. A promise with destiny kept, and she is mourned most deeply in her passing. Join me, Rachel Martin, live from London, for special coverage of the funeral at Westminster Abbey, September 19th, from NPR News. That's early Monday morning, beginning at 5 a.m. here on WBEZ Chicago. WBEZ is supported by Chicago Children's Theater, presenting Leonardo, a wonderful show about a terrible monster based on the books by Mo Willems and adapted by Manuel Cinema, September 10th through October 16th, chicagochildrenstheater.org. Also by Live Nation, presenting Dave Cause and Friends 25th Anniversary Christmas Tour coming to the Chicago Theater December 8th. Tickets are available now at livenation.com. Another great-looking day, warming up to 83. It's 81 right now, sunny skies, partly cloudy tonight, a low of 67. This is WBEZ. Back now with more Reset. I'm your host, Sasha Ann Simons. Now, if you're just tuning in, it's our weekly news recap, where we make sense of the week's top local and state stories. For the break, we took a look at the latest alderman to exit city council and 
efforts to help the migrants being sent to Chicago from Texas. But there is a lot more to get to. And Republican gubernatorial candidate Darren Bailey has released five years worth of tax returns. Governor Pritzker today denounced an independent campaign commercial that blames him for the rise in violent crime since he took office. The widely seen ad features surveillance footage of a group of men attacking a lone woman on a Lakeview street. Darren Bailey now confirming this afternoon that he is renting an apartment on the Mag Mile. Money could be coming your way. Illinois is offering income tax and property tax rebates. Our panel today is WTTW political correspondent Amanda Vinicky, WBEZ city government reporter Mariah Wolfel, and Mike Lowe, reporter for WGN-TV News. Remember, if you're watching us online right now on WBEZ's Facebook or YouTube pages, feel free to leave us a comment or a question. Talk to us in that YouTube chat box and we might just mention what you have to say about these news stories on the air. Let's jump right back into it, Amanda, with money. Roughly 6 million Illinois residents will soon be receiving one-time tax rebate checks in the mail. Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton was happy to share the good news. Starting now and in the coming weeks, a person in Illinois can walk up to their mailbox thinking, I'm just going to find another bill that needs to be paid. But instead, they find a postcard sent from the state of Illinois telling them that they have money on the way. Say what now, Amanda? Break that down. Hey, hey, who doesn't like <laughs> money? money on the way, she said. <laughs> yes. Okay. It, at least for the, the, when? the bulk of adults, it'll be coming <laughs> uh, starting this week. Okay. And it will either be actually a check in your mailbox or it could be direct deposited, in which case you're supposed to receive a postcard. By the way, this will come in the order. It's sort of first come, first filed. So if you filed your taxes right away, you're going to be getting your money first. If you waited a little bit, it'll be coming later. Uh, in it will be coming later as in the next six to eight weeks. Lo and behold, oh, wait, is that when there's going to be early voting and <laughs> oh just ahead God. of an election? Oh my God. What a coincidence. Weird that. <laughs> uh, not weird that. Uh, <laughs> Amanda, they're not connected. Yeah, not at all. I mean, th there is, Illinois was in a position because in part of a lot of factors with the pandemic, um, Democrats will say it has nothing to do with the surge of federal funding. Republicans say that's what it's all about. They're, they're sort of both right. Um, and in terms of just how goods were, purchased, uh, goods were purchased and what that did to sales taxes coming in, that Illinois, by the way, many other states doing something similar, and in cases, something far bigger than Illinois is getting. This is something that is going to apply at least the income tax rebates will be for anybody who has an adjusted gross income of under two hundred thousand okay. dollars. Then you get fifty dollars per person. So that could be as much as. And then there's also if you have an adjusted gross income of two hundred fifty k or less and own property, you'll also can be receiving greater uh, a property tax rebate. The most that this could be, this would be for a joint filer with three kids and property that meets the $300 rebate max for uh, it would be 700 bucks. Oh. So certainly, um, but for a lot of people, it might be just $50. Yeah. Um, and it is certainly something that is, as I noted, in terms of the timing, uh, one could argue that due to inflation, something that will very much help families. Uh, many others would argue that this is something that Illinois could have used, uh, put money toward social services, toward paying down debt, mm -hmm. toward plenty of other things. Um, but it is uh, you, you'll see it in campaign commercials, and there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, uh, Amanda, as much as taxpayers, like you said, they might welcome these rebates. Republican gu gubernatorial candidate Darren Bailey had a different perspective. This is an election year ploy. I think people are going to, to see this and understand this. Do you think it's a coincidence, Mike, that this gift to taxpayers is coming just weeks before the election? Oh, it's, cer <laughs> As it's certainly, pointed out? certainly not a coincidence. <laughs> and, and what you're seeing is both sides will play it up for the election. Yeah. Uh, you know, on the Democratic side, we put money in your pocket to help deal with the inflation and Darren Bailey, as you just heard, is saying this is just a ploy to get votes right before, you know, a few weeks before we well, go to the polls. speaking of taxpayers, Darren Bailey released his tax returns yesterday. He wasn't going to originally do that, was he, Amanda? No, he had said when asked by a Sun-Times reporter, uh, he had said, no, I'm not going to. And then dropped this week, at least the top sheets. I mean, we don't have all of the financial information by any means about Bailey's assets, wealth, we just have top sheets of his federal returns. And they, they, it is still interesting. And really what it showed was a lot of 
deficits, sort of ups and downs, sometimes um, showing an adjusted gross income of up to about $200,000 in 2018, and then the past couple of years showing almost that much in deficit, which would mean ostensibly, again, we didn't see the state tax returns, no taxable income liability. Didn't he get millions in federal farm subsidies? He did that. And he also, by the way, so he owns a whole lot of acreage. And um, when you when you kind of do the math on that, we, we don't know exactly how much, but something like 12,000 acres. And that's some valuable farmland. So while you, you see deficit uh, and you might think, oh, gosh, he's broke. It, it is certainly <laughs> not that. Owns, uh, has a lot of money tied up in farm implements and actual land. And there is he owns a freight company as well, uh, runs a private school. So this is well. the sort of things where farming taxes, I'm not in agriculture. I don't know, nor am I an accountant, but they are more complex. So you, if you look at that, um, th- there, there's a whole lot that could be going on that we cannot tell just from a couple of sheets. Interesting. It, it, he has said that he is uh, likely to be a millionaire. And by the way, this is, of course, no match. However wealthy he seems to be, which is wealthy in many people's eyes, um, nowhere near, of course, billionaire Pritzker. Nowhere near. This is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. We are going behind the headlines in the weekly news recap with WTTW's Amanda Vinicky, WBEZ's Mariah Wolfel, and Mike Lowe of WGN-TV News. So we're going to stick with the governor's race for a little bit longer. An ad that aired during last Sunday's Bears game that came under fire. Before we get to the ad, though, who saw the Bears game? Because that was some crazy weather. (laughs) I I was in Philadelphia this weekend watching the Eagles. Oh. And they had the Bears game on. And no one was paying attention to the Bears game, obviously. But you were. were. watching the Eagles game. (laughs) We were watching the Bears game. And you just start seeing people paying attention, like, oh, my God, look at Chicago. It's crazy. <laughs> it's just wet. Like, yeah. it, it's, <laughs> it's something so... that I, I will miss as a Bears fan if they move to a dome is that the elements games, right, whether it's the rain, the snow, the fog. Uh, I can do it's, without it's so it. Much Bring fun on the dome. To me to watch. <laughs> the slip and slide <laughs> looks dome. really fun at the end. Oh I wish God, that we so could cute. all have just gotten yeah. on the field and done <laughs> that, the same. That looks like a that dang did good look time. Pretty, pretty cool. All right, so let's turn to that ad that I, I talked up there. It aired during the game. It was created by this group called, uh, they call themselves People Who Play by the Rules. Describe the ad for us, Mike. So, as you mentioned, we were all inside on Sunday afternoon watching the Bears game, or most of Chicago was. And yeah. you typically, in the commercial breaks, have beer commercials, truck commercials, this grabbed everyone's attention because it was a a black slate with white uh, letters on it that says Sunday in Lakeview or something to that effect. And then the next thing you hear is this blood-curdling scream for about 10 or 15 seconds, and you see the image of ring doorbell video of a woman being attacked by three people in Lakeview uh, and having her, like, purse ripped. She's, She's pulled down to the sidewalk. And it's it's a very frightening scene. And let's be clear, Mike, a white woman being attacked by three black men. Right. Yes. W- right. And actually, there's now some debate over that, uh, but we can get into that in a moment. Um, no, let's get into it now. Okay. Yeah. So, so what are they saying? Gov- Governor Pritzker called the ad disgusting. Um, at the end of the ad, uh, Pritzker and Mayor Lightfoot's images appear, and and the words on the screen say, "How much worse does it have to get?" Wow. So, uh, so Governor Pritzker. Uh, responded saying it was disgusting and saying that it was clearly racially tinged showing African-American people attacking a white woman. And yeah. Dan Proft, who is the uh, political consultant and former radio host behind the ad, said, well, I can't tell that they're what race the attackers are. You're putting race into this. And so that even now is a, I see. Is a That's subject the back and of forth. contention. Let's listen to what you just described, Pritzker being all worked up about this ad. I'm saying that the intent of the people who put it out, look at all the things that they're involved in, clearly has a racial tinge to it. Darren Bailey uh, sanctions these kinds of uh, ads, uh, thinks they're okay, has accepted the support of that PAC, uh, and Darren Bailey is the one who voted to defund police, literally voted against budgets that would fund state police. Yeah. D- Darren Bailey was asked about this uh, yeah, after what's the he ad. saying? He basically said, look, that's a separate group. If they want to put that out, they're on their own doing that. But if they want to get this message out to the public, you know, he's essentially supporting the message and their ability to to put it out there. Um, There were also victims' rights groups that were upset about this, saying that only victims should decide how to tell their story. It should never be taken Mm -hmm. uh, from them and put in a political ad like this. uh, Without permission, which was not given from what we know. Amanda, 
What about the governor's claim there at the end that uh, Bailey voted to defund state police? Well, you did have Republicans at large voting. They they voted for the, the tax rebates that we previously talked about. They had actually said that there were opportunities to give more back or make it more permanent, but that they weren't included in those conversations. But something is better than nothing. Republicans, however, voted against most of the other spending in the budget. So that's what Pritzker is referencing. Is this Bailey? Um, th- 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 I would say it is a twist to say that Bailey wants to defund the police. He has called for additional spending. But Republicans are the super minority in Springfield. So they don't really have a big say in the budget. Is it true that the Republican candidate for governor, as well as other Republicans, voted against money that will go toward police in this year's budget? Yes. And that is because they voted in general against the budget, which they say they did not have a role in shaping because Democrats crafted it. They have super majorities and the governor's office. They can and did. Lots to talk about this week when it comes to Darren Bailey. I'm looking at you, Mariah, because This downstate farmer is now our new neighbor (laughs) here in the city that he's repeatedly called a hellhole. I'm confused. Yeah, he says he's retiring at what many know as the John Hancock building um, or, you know, live. Is it known as anything else? Right, 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 right. (laughs) Um, To immerse himself in the culture of the city of Chicago. Uh, Maybe that's like going to Disneyland. So he moved to to Chicago. Yeah, (laughs) or something like that. Um, To immerse yourself in the city of Chicago by living in the downtown area. Um, Hopefully he's getting out into neighborhoods, but... um, you know, I, I think he's been calling Chicago a hellhole for months. In many ways, I think Darren Bailey is playing right into the role that Pritzker wanted him to play into when he spent when Democrats spent money for Darren Bailey to beat Richard Irvin in the primary. Um, how the narrative of hellhole insulting, you know, one of the city's one of the state or the, the state's, state's biggest yeah. city is a strategy. But, you know, he's also I think this week said something along the lines of like, uh, yeah, you know, it's it's a hellhole, but, you know, th- what can we do to make this state and this city better? And he's also walked back hellhole by saying, you know, it's it's a it's a great city, um, but it needs a lot of work. And I you know, that could play to people who also live in the downtown area who think that the city is worse off than it was four years ago um, and who are experiencing crime for the first or the fear of crime for, you know, maybe the first time in their Mm -hmm. lives, as we've seen headlines about crime downtown. I think um, Darren Bailey is living in a district that has seen an increase in shootings and murders over the past year. And so he could be appealing to that demographic in some way. I don't know if hellhole is the right word choice. Especially not for the magnificent mile. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. right. Uh, Bailey also received some criticism from the Jewish community. This was after his visit to the Palestinian American Club of Bridgeview. What did he do, Amanda? You know, he has come under fire for a couple of things. First of all, a lot of um, folks were already incensed because of remarks that were unveiled that he'd made previously in a Facebook video in which he said that more that that the uh, abortion was a bigger atrocity than the Holocaust. So that was sort of the the, the big strike. In this case, he uh, appeared and gave a speech before an organization with a map behind him that uh, erased Israel, period. Um, and so oh. it just showed, you know, Palestine. Uh, and so that is where it is viewed as um, anti-Semitic. I have not, I, I think that um, it is going to be something that plagues his campaign, but it is among many numbers of things that will plague his campaign um, in addition to the fact that he simply doesn't have really any money to get out any sort of message if there really is a message there's there's anti-crime he has a platform for addressing it but i would say it is not one that is particularly thorough and he hasn't gotten anything out so um yeah there you go well finishing up our look at the governor's rates uh pritzker and bailey they're they're soon going to be facing off against each other for the first time in debates right so what are the details there mike so next our media incorporated is the company that bought the Tribune. So it is now the parent company of WGN TV and radio. They're the largest owner of uh, TV stations around the country, including several in the state of Illinois. So they offered to essentially televise debates, two debates uh, between the candidates. One will take place on October 6th at uh, uh, on the campus of Illinois State University. Yeah. Um, so you kind of get central Illinois and 
that'll cover something like 96% of the households. These will be primetime debates. The second one, uh, 7 o'clock on WGN, produced at the WGN studios. Uh, so you'll you'll be able to see the candidates face-to-face in two separate debates that will be seen around the state uh, in primetime. And I it think that's be interesting. Yeah, it really will be because we haven't seen both yeah, of them it's time. on the same stage. It's time. Yeah. They've Past kind of been, time, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. That is WTTW political correspondent Amanda Vinicky, WBEZ city government reporter Mariah Wolfel, and Mike Lowe, who's a reporter for WGN TV News. There is much more of our weekly news recap to come, but first, let's check back in with Lisa Labez. Hey, Sasha. So uh, oil titan BP this week has agreed to a settlement over air pollution from its largest refinery, the one in Whiting, Indiana. BP says it will pay $2.75 million to settle this lawsuit over air pollution. Environmentalists had sued over the emissions from the Whiting facility. The facility processes crude oil for fuels and asphalt, and emissions are linked to asthma and cardiovascular illnesses. Now, under this deal, the payments will be divided between a government fund for clean air enforcement and an environmental projects in the area. A judge has found key parts of Michigan's newborn blood testing program are unconstitutional. Four parents had challenged the program, raising concerns about how leftover samples are used long after screening for rare diseases has taken place. Parents are given a form at childbirth, uh, asking for consent to use blood spots for research. But attorney Phil Ellison argues the form is vague and it leaves parents without enough information. And this week's decision is likely to have an impact on how Michigan maintains millions of samples and then makes them available for outside research. On the next Science Friday, we've been told that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain and that antidepressants correct it. Well, it's not that simple. Something happens in the brain and clearly is much more complicated than just filling the tank with gas. Delving into depression meds on Science Friday from WNYC Studios. That's this afternoon at 1 o'clock on WBEZ Chicago. Just because you stopped your car doesn't mean you have to stop listening. With just a tap of your phone, WBEZ can stay by your side all day. Let's go everywhere together. Listen to WBEZ on the mobile app. WBEZ is supported by Jane Addams College of Social Work, University of Illinois, Chicago. The Master of Social Work program at Jane Addams provides an education for social and racial justice. More at socialwork.uic.edu. Also by Art Barn School of Art, hosting Art Blitz, a festival for all ages, featuring demos, activities, music, and food September 17th through the 18th with open admission. More at artbarnschool.org. Also by Illinois Holocaust Museum, presenting Ghost Army, the combat con artists of World War II an exhibit about a platoon of artists that fooled the Nazis. More at ilholocaustmuseum.org. It's 80 degrees, sunny skies, 1243. This is WBEZ. This is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons, and we are back with more of our weekly news recap, giving you a closer look at the week's top stories across Chicago and Illinois. Before the break, we took a deep dive into the governor's race, but we still have more to get to. Our panel is WTTW political correspondent Amanda Vinicky, WBEZ city government reporter Mariah Wolfel, and Mike Lowe, who's a reporter for WGN-TV News. We're also still live right now on Facebook and YouTube for those of you who prefer to watch. All right, Mike, uh, we talked earlier in the program about uh, vice, uh, vice President. Uh, she is actually in Chicago today. Can you tell us why she's here? As I look at the clock, I think she landed at Midway about an hour ago. Okay. Uh, she's here to participate in a couple of different events uh, to talk about the abortion issue. Uh, she's going to be uh, partaking in a, in a roundtable discussion with uh, the Attorney General General of Illinois, uh, Rami Kwa, or Kwame Raoul, and uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot today at UIC. And then I believe she's going to be at a rally later with Governor Pritzker. Uh, this is significant because we have seen um, this be a driving issue uh, to getting more people to uh, register to vote, particularly young women. And so they're going to talk about these these issues and why it's important to make your voice heard mm-hmm. and uh, getting that message to young people on the campus of the University of Illinois Chicago today. I'm going to stick with you for a bit here because the, the verdict is in and the trial is over. So where did the jury land in R&B singer R. Kelly's trial, Mike? It was a bit of a split decision. Uh, okay. R. Kelly was found guilty on three child pornography counts and three counts of enticing minors for sex, but he was acquitted 
on seven other charges uh, that included obstruction of justice, uh, conspiracy to receive child pornography, um, and all of his co-defendants were also found not guilty of the charges. Uh, This was a case that it's obviously been in the news for uh, years now. Um, he was originally arrested on these charges in Chicago uh, mm-hmm. while he was, I think, out walking his dog in 2019. And that was around the same time that uh, the Lifetime docuseries Surviving R. Kelly came out yeah. and, and really brought many of these issues to the forefront. But um, what really, if you heard or or read about any of the testimony, it was graphic. The jurors were shown portions of videos in which um, the uh, victim in this case, who went by Jane in court, uh, who is at the or was at the time 14 years old yeah. uh, when these acts uh, happened, um, she told her story, and the jurors were persuaded by it. And it, we were talking a moment ago uh, during the break about how courageous it is for someone to to relive all of this I can only and do it imagine. several times. And, and I mean, when this was happening in real time, like I, I remember these headlines. I remember being in like high school hearing about all of this and to know that I obviously it's much later than high school and we're still talking about like the, justice is finally being served. That's got to be difficult yeah, for the, the victims. The, these rumors came out, you know, R. Kelly, many of us remember, uh, I believe I Can Fly was the soundtrack to Space Jam. And oh, yeah. he's been atop the charts. Celebrated uh, for so long. Celebrated for so long. But there were always these rumors or uh, it was talked about that he had this, you know, other side to him where there but was. But then he would show up at the Grammys or whatever. And you're like, OK, fine. I guess that wasn't true. Or Right. Know, but, and so yeah. so now he's uh, he faces a number of years. He obviously has not been sentenced yet, but uh I think each of those counts he was found uh, guilty on carries with it a potential sentence of 20 years. Mm. On top of what he's already On top of what he's already been convicted of. Were you surprised by the jury's verdict, Mike? No. uh, You know, and I I was reading some of the comments um, from the lawyers, and his lawyers say that the case was overcharged, uh, and they expected that some of those other counts, obstruction of justice, and was he... Uh, actively trying to hide the videos and those things weren't going to be able to be proved. The prosecution uh, said that, you know, they brought everything they thought they could they could make a case on. Yeah. Um, I think it. we had already seen what had happened in New York, uh, and it's. I, I don't think it was surprising at all that the worst of the charges were he was found guilty. On. Yeah. Let's head over to the uh, west suburbs now. The Downers Grove Public Library It made headlines this week for canceling an event. What happened there, Mike? So the Downers Grove Public Library was going to have uh, a drag queen event. And these have now become, it seems like we're hearing about these nationally. There was one uh, at a bakery uh, in the suburbs just a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, These have become lightning rod kind of uh, social wedge issues. Um, They were going to have a a bingo game. hosted by a drag queen. And it was to show in the library's view that they're inclusive of all communities, uh, you know, a one night thing. But this rankled the ire of uh, many conservatives in the community. And they said there's, you know, a sexual aspect to all of this. And this is not something that should be happening on uh, taxpayer paid for property at libraries. And they received a number of threats. to safety. And so the library just said, look, we can't, if we can't account for everybody's safety here, we can't hold this event. So they had to cancel. And these were going to be family friendly events, right? And we're talking about a bakery and a library. Here. Right, right. Uh, they, they were designed Wild. to be inclusive, family friendly yeah. and, and show just let them have their fun. A dis- different aspect of the community. The, right. I think there's a sense of like, if you don't like it, then don't go don't to the bingo go. game. Don't go to the bakery when it's happening. But uh, there, at least in the case of the library, whereas the the bakery was a private business, the library there's some sense of you shouldn't be doing this on tax, mm. you know, on you know, public land. What, what kind of strikes me this feeds back to our earlier discussion in terms of the aldermanic exodus. Also covered some months ago a hearing in Washington D.C. related to. Um, the 2020 election and election judges that were 
threatened, stalked at their homes, uh, really persecuted and threatened with violence. And, and that's why this event it's was canceled. It wasn't back, right, right. It, it wasn't backing down from the event itself. It was, again, a matter of, of safety. And that's sort of where we're at. And I have to say that is a very dispiriting and frightening place to be in all of these sectors and something that I don't think we should discount for when you look at who's willing to run for election, who's willing to serve, and oh, yeah. another yeah. thing that could be going on behind some of these decisions. And not not just at big high profile things, but the library board, for yeah. example. Oh, and, and that's that's a strategy that's going on because right. that's a place where you can get to, get out to in front of people, intimidate them. I mean, we saw this during the mask debates at, at school board meetings and so forth, saying they're going to come after you. And, you and know, it's your neighbors. It's, it's your it's, neighbors. It's, exactly. It's it's your friends, your kids, friends, parents. They're yelling at awful. you. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. a very... Like you said, it's a disquieting effect that we're seeing in our politics right now. This is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. We're going behind the headlines in the weekly news recap with WGN-TV News' Mike Lowe, WBEZ's Mariah Wolfel, and WTTW's Amanda Vinicky. Uh, looking at you now, Mariah, Riot Fest, mm -hmm. that's taking place in Douglas Park today. Uh, this, though, could be its farewell tour at the, the Westside Park. Chicago Park District announced a new rule. So can you tell us the details there? Sure. So they are proposing a rule that would require board approval for events in parks that will bring over 10,000 visitors to the to public land. Currently, the parks commissioner is the one who approves any money making events in um, in on public land in the city uh, to kind of, you know, get through get those events through quickly. Um, and so this, you know, would put at least one kind of barrier to things like Riot Fest, which have been the subject of controversy in Douglas Park, residents, mm -hmm. activists speaking out against this massive, you know, money making festival coming into the public park, occupying it for a weekend, 40,000 people coming to the park, at, you know, every single day um, with without resident uh, input or say. And so this and year, that's actually, a big disruption. I mean, huge if disruption. you live there, oh, right? Yeah, for you sure. Yeah, it's a neighborhood, you know, it's a neighborhood park. People sure. use it. Um, in their regular day to day. Um, and, you know, this is a theme that we're seeing. Aldermen are also trying to get more say over events like NASCAR, you know, which we know is going to occupy the downtown area for quite a while next year. Um, and just people, residents looking for more checks and balances on these massive events that do bring revenue to yeah. the city and tax dollars, but that, um, you know, residents want to have a little bit more say in. The, the Park District Board of Commissioners has to hold community meetings, right, before the decision gets made? Yeah, so that's that's something that they implemented, I think, in the past year where they did, you know, look for feedback from residents okay. um, ahead of large-scale events, and that I think that they'll continue to do going forward, but this is just another check that would actually require a board vote. That hasn't been approved yet um, by the Park District Board, but it's been proposed at their meeting this past So to your point, you know, this doesn't just affect Riot Fest. There's Pitchfork in Union Park, Lala, which shuts down Grant Park. Is it time for these concerts to just rent out Soldier Field <laughs> <laughs> instead? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know what the contract looks like for Pitchfork or Riot Fest, but as we all know, the city just signed a new, another 10-year contract with Lollapalooza, so for the yeah. foreseeable future... That massive festival will be in Grant Park, but yeah, there are other venues that yeah, aren't. Like where might these concerts be held instead? Well, I it, mean, there's Northerly Island, there's Soldier Field, there's Wrigley Field. There are places that are, you know, meant for large scale events that aren't on yeah. public land. Sure. And especially as or, Chicago yeah. looks at continually developing, I mean, there are so many of these mega development mixed use sites that are in the works. Lincoln Yards, one would right, yeah. Lincoln oh, yeah, Yards, the 78, one. one Central. I mean, there there's so many. Um, what is going on with McPeer? It seems like something that there should be a larger conversation of of what goes where, sort of think about <laughs> yeah. it with some intentionality. And this is different than like street, fe you know, as we know, street festivals in Chicago, because they're on the public way, are free to residents. This is much different um, when there's a festival coming into your neighborhood. Lollapalooza is what, like? 200 bucks for a day, probably more than that. I don't know. I wouldn't hundreds know. Of I haven't dollars. been there. People spend hundreds of dollars. You know, <laughs> right. it's not Too like old. that's an accessible thing <laughs> residents old. can go enjoy at on the public park. Are you going to Riot Fest, Mike? I will not be at Riot Fest. <laughs> <laughs> How did I know? <laughs> 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 I 
had a feeling. Uh, so as we wrap up the recap, I'm wondering what stories really stuck out to you folks this week. Like maybe they surprised you. Maybe you thought they were underreported. Um, I'll start with you, Mariah. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. I was thinking about what story I'm going to be looking ahead to next week, which oh, sure. is uh, the city of Chicago. I'm, and this is like a PSA. The city of Chicago budget season is about to get underway da, da, in the da, next da. couple of weeks. The first step is we'll hear a budget address from Mayor Lori Lightfoot about where her priorities are going to be. You know, like some of the uh, programs we talked about in the past year, like the cash assistant, the gu- guaranteed basic income program, mm-hmm. the 911 alternative response pilot. Those were programs that were announced in the budget address. We'll hear that in the next couple of weeks, and then we'll go into a marathon round of two weeks of budget hearings. Um, so, you know, ways to engage or to call your alderman, tune yes. into these budget hearings. Which is important stuff. Yeah. Important, important stuff. What about you, Amanda? So something that I'm not sure was underreported <clears throat> in a sense – I don't think overreporting can be a thing, but at least um, oh, in terms of <laughs> in terms of just the, the conversation and sort of social media and dispelling myths. And by the way, we talked about the ad that was aired by the people who play by the rules pack, but Prof also, by the way, is behind a series of quote unquote newspapers that are being sent to homes across Chicago and Please do look at them with skepticism. It's, they are very it's pointedly real fake news. It really is I think fake Chicago news. Chicago City it's, Wire, I think. Yes, and they, they go by different names, but it, it really is political propaganda packaged as news. Um, and so, something that got a lot of attention, and I think will continue to. In, as well it should, um, is the quote-unquote safety act, that criminal justice uh, law that I referenced earlier, parts yeah. of which have already begun to take effect, but really in a large scale will be in January of 2023. Um, both sides, I think, have stretched the truth some, and there is yeah. uh, on that, and it truly is important, and I don't think it will be easy to know exactly how this works yeah. um, going forward, but that's something that we'll be continuing to pay attention to, both in terms of uh, trying to dispel some of the the, the fake rees out there, mm-hmm. getting to the heart of what it will mean uh, for folks' safety as well as the yeah. criminal justice system. You watching the Bears-Packers game, Mike? I definitely will be, and I think that's, <laughs> I, you know, that's a fun story to end on, and that the Bears surprisingly won yesterday, or, I mean, uh, last week, and we they did it in such a memorable Let's environment keep it going. and yeah to take on the packers who are 0 and 1 uh they the packers look weak for the first time in in recent memory and yeah. uh wouldn't that be fun to have the bears at 2 and 0 and the packers at 0 and 2 that would be pretty sweet <laughs> that was mike Lowe, reporter for wgn tv news wttw political correspondent amanda vinicky and wbez city government reporter mariah wolfel thank you all thank, thank you that's it for Reset. The show is produced by Meha Ahmed, Linnea Dominic, Brenda Ruiz, Claire Hyman, Andrea Guffman, Charles Daston, and Andrew Merriweather. Dan Tucker's our executive producer. Ethan Schwab and Haley Bloomquist were our engineers this week. Monday on the show, flu season is coming, so our resident infectious disease specialist, Dr. Mia Teramina, will be back to answer your COVID and flu questions. Feel free to email them to us over the weekend, reset at wbez.org. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. Thank you so much for listening and have yourselves a great weekend. We'll meet again soon. It is 1258. This is 91.5 WBEZ. What do you think about a a private helicopter tour of Chicago? Well, that tour could be yours when you give now at WBEZ. This unique view of the city is available only until 7 o'clock tonight. You can give now at WBEZ.org slash donate.